Long ago, in Israel, lived Jesus Christ. He was the Son of God and lived to spread the Word of God to the people of Israel. Throughout his life, he performed many impressive miracles and traveled the land, helping the poor and needy. Over time, he built up a following of devoted disciples who traveled with him and listened to him as he taught his lessons of love and compassion. Jesus would go out into the remote locations and find a place where he could speak to as many of his followers as possible all at once. Sometimes he would climb on top a mountain, other times into a boat so that he could address his crowd of disciples. He shared with them many important stories, known as parables. These parables are a series of tales that have a hidden meaning, and Jesus used them to teach his followers how to live according to the word of God. One day, Jesus gave a very important sermon, known as the Sermon on the Mount. During this sermon, Jesus told his followers parables about the need to keep faith and believe in the Word of God. We can learn a lot from the parables he told that day, one of which was the story of the two builders. One was foolish, and the other was wise. Gather round, my disciples. I have a story to share with you about making the right decisions in our lives and how every decision can affect us in the future. Once, there were two men who ventured away from the city they were born in to build themselves new homes far away. The two men walked along the banks of a mighty river, looking for the perfect place to each build their homes. The river ran through a great valley and would make a perfect shelter for a new home. Eventually, the two men found a spot that they liked. This looks like a good spot to build. Just the right distance. Now we just have to choose where to build. The two men looked around the area, and eventually, each man said he knew where he would build his house. I know where I'm going to build, right here by the riverbank. By building here on the sand, I can easily get water straight into my house without having to walk all the way down the valley. As you wish, but I will be building my house up there. That way, I can build on rock instead of the sand. I would prefer my house to stand on solid ground. I have to walk further to get my water, but I would prefer that rather than build it on the soft sand of the riverbank. And so, the two men got to work building their homes. Eventually, they finished. They were skilled workers. And by the time they were finished, each of them had built a fine home. For a time, they both enjoyed their homes. The builder on the sand was especially happy that he had such easy access to the water of the mighty river and enjoyed taking baths as often as he could. While the builder on the rock could not enjoy the water of the river as freely as his neighbor, he was still happy with his choice to build upon the solid rock at the top of the valley. Until one day, everything changed. A mighty storm appeared on the horizon, and quickly the angry clouds made their way across the skies towards the valley where the two builders had made their new homes. When the storm arrived, chaos was unleashed. The rain fell and fell and would not cease. For days it rained. Then those days turned to weeks Raging winds blew constantly, and still the rain would not stop. As the storm continued to rage on without any signs of stopping, the river began to fill up 
more and more. Eventually, the river could not handle all the extra water, and the banks of the river burst. When the builder on the sand saw the great flood rush towards his home, he finally understood his foolishness. The flood rushed towards the newly built house that he was so proud of and immediately destroyed it. The walls crumbled, the floor was swept away, and everything the foolish builder owned was washed away into the swelling river. As the foolish builder watched his house crumble and his entire life be washed away, the other house in the valley remained standing strong. The other builder was wise in his decision. By choosing to build on the solid rock, he created a better foundation for his home, meaning that the strong rain and wind didn't shake his home and the flooding river did not wash it away. Even when there was not a trace left of the foolish builder's home, the wise builder remained safe and sound from the storm in his home built on solid rock. Please let me in. My home has been washed away and I am left with nothing. Thankfully, the wise builder was also a kind man and did not allow the foolish builder to suffer for his mistake. Instead, he welcomed him into his home, and there they both waited until eventually the great storm passed. You see, my friend, this is why I chose to build my house here, safe up on solid rock. Although I may not have had easy access to the river as you, and it was not so easy for me to enjoy luxuries like a bath whenever I felt like one, I still chose to build on solid rock and not on soft sand that could so easily allow the house to crumble and fall. How wise of you, my friend. I now see the mistake I made. I should have thought more carefully and made sure to create a proper foundation for my house to make sure it kept standing, even in the most harsh of storms. Now I must rebuild my entire life from scratch because of my foolish mistake. But one thing is for certain, when I build my new home, I will learn from your wisdom and build it on the rock and not the sand. And so, the foolish builder saw the error of his ways and learned from the wisdom of his neighbor, the wise builder. By the time Jesus had finished telling the parable of the wise and foolish builders, the crowd that had gathered to listen to him had grown to an enormous number. When the story was finished, the crowd were all silent, astonished at the story and the power of Jesus' words. Paul, one of Jesus' most beloved followers, asked the great prophet to explain the story. Jesus, please share with us the meaning of this incredible tale. Well, Paul, let's see. What can we learn from the decisions that the two builders took? Mary, another of Jesus' followers, stepped forward to offer an answer. That we need to be careful about where we build our homes. Building on rock gave the wise builder a good foundation and a strong house. And building on sand gave the foolish builder a bad foundation and a weak house. The storms we face in our lives could be anything loss, sadness, difficulty, but as long as we build our lives on a good foundation, we can remain strong and unbroken by these challenges. And what is the foundation of a good life? As the rock was a solid foundation for the wise builder's house, the Word of God is a strong foundation for our lives. If we listen to the wisdom and love that the Lord offers us and build our lives on it, we can enjoy a solid life and withstand any storm. We all need to be like the wise builder. As rock is a foundation for a strong house, God is the foundation for a strong life. Understanding the parable, the crowd was amazed. That day at the Sermon on the Mount, 
Jesus taught his followers a lesson they would never forget. To make the Word of God the strongest foundation for a good and successful life. The Ark of the Covenant was an impressive chest, covered in pure gold, that was home to some of the most holy objects in all of Israel. Inside the chest were stone tablets that carried the Ten Commandments, given directly to Moses by God atop Mount Sinai. Also inside the Ark, there was a staff that belonged to Aaron, Moses' brother. This staff had been blessed with many magical powers during the plagues of Egypt. As it carried such precious holy objects, it was incredibly important that the Israelites kept the Ark of the Covenant safe. Since the time of Moses, the Ark had been kept in a sacred tent called the Tabernacle. Wherever the Israelites went, the Ark and the Tabernacle came with them. Even as the Israelites wandered the desert for 40 years, the Ark was always kept safe in the sacred tabernacle. For many years, the Israelites struggled to hold control of the land and fought many battles against the Philistines before they finally managed to regain control of Jerusalem. King David led the Israelites to victory and with great pride, they returned the Ark to Jerusalem, where peace had been achieved at last. When the Israelites finally managed to fulfill God's wish and settle in the holy city of Jerusalem, King David placed the Ark in the holy tent. There he offered sacrifices, gave food to those in need, and spread blessings to his people in the holy presence of the Ark. But the time had come to give the Ark a permanent home in Jerusalem. Now that Jerusalem is our home, we shall honor God by building a magnificent temple to house the ark. Building this mighty temple to God was one of King David's greatest desires. But the temple was to be a temple of peace, and King David was a warrior. It was God's wish that a man of peace would build the temple for the ark. And so King David turned to one of his sons, who was holy and known for his devotion to God. The son's name was Solomon. Years passed, and King David reached the end of his life. Before he died, he had given Solomon the preparations for the magnificent temple that was to be built. When Solomon became king, he accepted this duty with great determination, and immediately got to work on creating a most spectacular temple, one so magnificent that it would please the Lord. Building this temple will not be easy. No, it will take many years. We will need hundreds of thousands of workers, and we will need to gather vast amounts of material from all across the land. Creating this temple and paying respect to the Lord will take all of our dedication. Will you swear to me that you will join me on this mission and do whatever it takes to build the great temple that God has asked of us? Solomon was pleased, and they wasted no time getting to work on this incredible project. Finally, four years after Solomon had become king, his claim to throne was firmly established, and he was able to begin work on building his projects. And so the great construction began. Solomon brought 30,000 men from across all of Israel to go to the neighboring land of Lebanon to help collect the wood that would be needed to build the temple. This group of 30,000 was sent to Lebanon in shifts. Each group would go and spend one month in Lebanon, collecting the wood 
and then be allowed to return home for two months and be with their families. But the construction required more than just wood. Solomon also signed up workers to mine and transport all the stone needed to build the temple. He gathered 150,000 men from the descendants of the people who had previously lived on the land. These men went to work in quarries and mines and worked day and night to bring all the stone needed to build the temple all the way across the land to Jerusalem. Solomon gathered so many precious metals from across the land that they could not even weigh it all. These metals were needed for crafting the screws, nuts, and bolts that would hold the mighty temple together. Every day, ships arrived from the surrounding lands, carrying gold, iron, and bronze, and all of this also had to be transported from the sea all the way to Jerusalem. Solomon was right when he promised his men that this project would take a lot of time and dedication. Twenty years passed before the palace was complete. But when it was, it was unparalleled in its greatness. No other temple in the land could compare to it. Inside of the temple, Solomon constructed a special chamber designed to house the Ark of the Covenant and its precious treasure. Inside the biggest room of the temple, known as the Holy Place, was the special chamber for the Ark, which was called the Most Holy Place. The walls of the Most Holy Place were covered from top to bottom with gold, and the room was home to two large statues of angels carved from fine olive wood. The two angels had their wings outstretched. Solomon even had these olive statues coated in gold, such was his devotion to the Lord. The chamber containing the Ark of the Covenant was so holy that only the high priest was allowed to enter this most holy place. Upon the completion of the temple, the people gathered to celebrate. For two whole weeks, the nation celebrated. There were so many speeches and special prayers, and the people feasted in the name of the Lord. When the celebrations were finished, Solomon told all the people that it was time for them to go home. My people, we have triumphed in building this great temple to God. But now it is time for you all to return to your homes as we begin the next chapter for Israel. And so the people left, and Solomon was finally alone with his creation. It was at that moment, when Solomon was all by himself, that God revealed himself and spoke to Solomon. Solomon, I am pleased with the temple you have built for me. Let it stand and remind us of the peace that has finally been achieved. It is magnificent, and surely anyone who comes here will be in awe and think of me. As long as you stay on the right path and obey the word of God, this temple shall remain standing as it does now. It will be a wonderful place for all. However, if you or the people fall from this path and disobey me, this temple will be worth nothing. Do you understand? Yes, my lord, I understand. I promise that I and the people will continue to follow your word. We shall not stray from the righteous path. The temple is nothing without you. And so Solomon had succeeded in fulfilling the wish of his father, David, and the will of God by building the mighty temple at Jerusalem. Unfortunately, Solomon did not keep his promise to God. Solomon began to take many wives. Some of these wives came from other lands and worshipped other gods. These wives would pray to their gods, perform sacrifices, and worship others who were not the Lord. Even though Solomon had begun his reign as king of Israel, by building the mighty temple for the Lord. By his later years, he had let his wives convince him to build other temples to worship their false gods. This upset the Lord, who had received Solomon's word that he would remain faithful. For this betrayal, Solomon and his people would pay. The Lord vowed that the land of Israel would be taken from Solomon's line and the Lord kept his promise, 
for Solomon's son was to be the last king of the United Kingdom of Israel that Saul, David, and Solomon had ruled before him. This was the price of breaking his promise to the Lord and worshiping others instead of keeping fate. The end.